Our guest today took the path of many aspiring American program directors. He started as a presenter on the air somewhere, and that usually starts in, in a small market for most guys. And then they kind of move up the ranks and maybe get a shot along the way to be a music director or an assistant program director. And finally, you convince somebody to give you a shot to be the man, to be the program director of a radio station. And Phil's journey has taken him to uh, quite a few states, including Michigan, Alabama, Indiana, New York, Florida, and others. And today he's got a really big job. He serves as the executive VP of content at Alpha Media in the US. He's responsible for a small amount of stations, uh, 207 yeah. in 44 wow. markets. And live from uh, Portland, Oregon, actually just in one of the suburbs, not too far from me, and also Portland's the home of Alpha Media. Please welcome today's guest, Bill Becker. Hi, thank you, everybody. It's exciting to be here. It's very cool to see all these names popping up over here from from all over the world. So I will I will try to not be underwhelming today, and uh, and share some stuff that hopefully will inspire and motivate and make us think. Awesome. So I, I think it's just uh, let's dive in, right? So because we got uh, limited time, so we want to get everything out of Phil as good as we can. So usually I think we start with um, most of our guests love, so hopefully you too. Um, obviously, everybody knows you as accomplished radio executive, but I'd like to know if there's something uh, that you can tell all the people that people don't know about Phil Becker. Um, yeah, sure. So, so my passion beyond media and music is probably design, uh, design and, and architecture. Uh, I'm very much into interior design and very much into, to lighting and, and, um, you know, the experience of walking into a space, I guess in some ways it's really similar to, to, to radio. You're trying to create a listening experience and in design, you're trying to create a visual experience. So there's one of the uh, the designs I was a, a part of there. As you can see, I am dressed up in my pajamas doing the Christmas tree there. Um, but uh, but design has been a passion of mine for probably the last 20, 25 years. So uh, it's really cool and a nice escape sometimes uh, when you're, especially as, you, as we're all sitting home, right? We're all sitting home and we're locked down. And, and so it's like, well, if this is going to be my bubble for a while, uh, what can I do with it? So uh, thanks for sharing that and asking. Yeah, Phil, I, I was definitely impressed with some of the pictures you shared in advance of the webinar with your contemporary taste. It was, it was really spectacular. So thank you. Um, thanks for letting us know that about you. Yeah. So as we prepared for today's webinar, um, I always spend time looking at our guest LinkedIn page. And I noticed your LinkedIn stream is filled with lots of quotes. I call them Philisms. When we chatted a bit more about them, you call them philosophies, which I think is a better name. We took one of the quotes from your stream and incorporated it in the title of today's webinar. And I want to start there. And the quote is this, the new best practice is to stop using best practices and try something new. So tell us more about this. Yeah. So, so a lot of these things, these, these philosophies came from a lot of meetings that we were holding at, at Alpha, you know, where we, where I was trying to create culture and direction and, and, and um, strategy. And people would say to me, hey, can you write that down? Or do you have that written down somewhere? And so I started to just collect these thoughts and, and then begin to put them you know, across sites and social. Um, but the new best practice is to stop using best practices and try something new. Actually came from a meeting that I hold called the WKRP in Cincinnati meeting. And I'm gonna take you inside the meeting today, okay? So when we do this meeting, I don't actually say, hey, we're going to have a meeting. I just say, we ordered some pizzas, come on by the conference room back when we used to go into offices, and let's, uh, <laughs> let's watch this episode. And you can pick any episode, Ken. You can pick any episode of the entire show. And then afterwards, I stop the show and I say, other than technology, what's something that they did on this show that we still aren't doing? Or what's something they did on this show that um, uh, is you, you thought was unique to us and really isn't? And, and, and whether it's the live remote episode where, where Johnny Fever gets robbed at the stereo store, whether it's the episode where Venus accidentally gives away $10,000 instead of $1,000, 
whether it's swear, swear to God, I thought turkeys could fly. I don't care which episode you pick. What's happening is we're not doing anything we weren't doing 40 years ago, right? And so I sat there and I started to say, you know, maybe the new best practice is to not go best practices say we should just try something new. Because if you do something new and it doesn't work, nobody remembers. What do you think they do? You think and they I do? agree with you. Yeah. They, they're not going to yeah, call I, I mean, and say that. So go ahead. Yeah. So I, I agree with you. Best practices are pretty much what everybody already does. Right. It's status quo. It doesn't set you apart. It doesn't take you further ahead. So I, I love this uh, philosophy. <laughs> Thank you. And thanks for sharing it. Yeah. Absolutely. I think um, for the second for the second quote, um, and that's that's the one that's that stuck out to me um, because obviously I'm not as a likable guy as Ken Benson is. So I, I usually have to tell people to like me. So. Um, Phil, your second uh, philosophy is uh, don't tell people to like your brand, make, make a brand people like to tell others about, which to me brings like a twofold question, like why the distinction and how do you actually create a brand people like to tell others about, opposed to telling people to like your brand, which I assume a lot of your competition and a lot of the radio stations uh, still do. So. Yeah, that's a great question. Well, the, the root the root of that question came from realizing that getting someone to care about your radio brand is just like getting them to care about you in real life. It's actually the same thing, right? Imagine that you went on a date and the first date you were on, you were like, I'm the greatest person you've ever dated. I'm the funniest. <laughs> I'm the best looking. I'm in the best shape. I make the most money. I'm amazing. You should really, really like me, right? <laughs> You would fail miserable. No one would ever date you. And they wouldn't want to be in the relationship. And radio, they do that. We, we, we don't stop and just create something meaningful and special and let people begin to fall in love with us. Right? I, I always scratch my head when, when I turn a brand new station on on launch day. And there's these actualities that go, I love this station. Well, you've been on the air for four hours. How, how, how is everyone already <laughs> calling you, and telling you how amazing you are? You know, this is the station we've been waiting for. We're just meeting, right? So, so don't sit there and tell me to like you. Just let me get there. Let me work through the process. You know, I, I, I also laugh when I see a brand new station uh, appear and all over social and all all these ads show up and the and, and billboards pop up pop in that say you know wxyz's number one hit music station well you've been on the air for a week and you've already dethroned everyone you know i i just i just hope that that programmers content creators people that are driving brands say i'm forming a relationship with my consumer with my fan with my listener and they'll tell people why they should be a part of it too. Yeah, absolutely agree. So we're chatting with Phil Becker. Uh, he's the head of content at Alpha Media. If you have a question for him, pop it in the chat box. Towards the end of the show, Phil is going to answer all your questions. Uh, Phil, as, as far as our questions go, we could spend the entire show here just asking you about your philosophies. But there's some other things we want to get to, so I'm just going to ask about one more. Sure. And I think it's a really good one and looking forward to what you have to say about it. But it goes like this. Tired bits and the over-reliance on contesting is making radio vulnerable to parody. Audiences are smarter than most give them credit for. So I'm going to ask for some examples of the types of bits and contests we need to stop doing. And then some examples of the things you think radio should be doing today. Yeah, sure. So there's a there's a Family Guy sketch. If you've never watched it, go on YouTube and look this up. Uh, it's a Family Guy sketch called Weenie in the Butt. And what it is, it's it's um, Seth MacFarlane's version of what a radio station sounds like. And guys, it's scary accurate how he sits there and parodies our business, right? So it got it got me to thinking. I was like, wow, we actually haven't really pushed ourselves past the WKRP example. Fast forward 40 years, now we're getting mocked on Family Guy. Why is that, 
right? And, and so I sat there and I said to myself, why, why is that happening? Well, it's probably happening to the point of this quote, Ken, which is, uh, and, and as I look at the people that are, that are on this list here, they can relate in their own universe. I was in a market where I turned on three radio stations and in the same quarter hour at the exact same time, I heard a second date update, a date or ditch, a go or ghost, and, and a first date follow-up. It's the same thing, right? And so I'm like, wow, we, we, we are not only relying on what we used to rely on, going back to the first quote about the new best practices to try something new, but then we just do what the other person was doing. And we're doing it in the same quarter hour and we're just putting a different name around it. So I, I want us to get away and I'll give you some examples of how I think we can evolve past that. But that's the tired bits. The over-reliance on contesting hit me when I was looking at COVID and its impact of events and concerts. And, and I'd have some calls with some people where they say, hey, I, I need some help. Happy to help. Uh, we don't know. We don't know what contest to do because there's no concerts. Or I don't have a promotion this week because there's no meet and greets, right? And so we have to start pushing ourselves to get away from the reliance of the bits we've heard everywhere and the promotions we've always done, right? So some examples of how we could push ourselves further. Um, the first part is the audience is okay knowing that wrestling is fake. The audience is okay knowing that reality TV is scripted. But we try to trick you into thinking that this date happened or that date happened. I think the audience is fine just knowing. You know, I was thinking about you last night, Ken. I, I love how, uh, and Andy was mentioning it before, the how humble you are. You're like, yeah, I used to work at MTV. There's that. On MTV, <laughs> you guys did a show called... Um, uh, what was it called? It was like, it was like dateless and desperate or, or some sort of like dating show. And I'm like, that's exactly what a first date follow-up is or a second date update is. So, so, you know, thinking about bits that we could do that are unique, that can only be answered by the host. Here's a crazy idea. What if we said to a host, what do you want to do instead of war of the roses tests really high? You should do that. Well, if that's not who I am in my core, at my belief, then I should be me. When it comes to promotions, I actually just sketch these down. And I see some of the programmers I work with on this call. Some of these are from these guys. I said, what do you want to do besides give away concert tickets? They're like, can we give away Bitcoin? Can we give away NFTs? Now think about this. You could make an NFT of a station event, appearance or photo, brand your station and give your listener something that no one else in the world can give them. You have something, it's one of one. They said, can we give away stocks? I said, what kind of stocks? They said, well, it depends on the format. Maybe Tesla, maybe Apple, maybe Google, maybe Amazon. Can we give away PS5s? See, we, we just sit here and we rely on contesting instead of relying on relationships. And I'm not saying we shouldn't contest. I know that contesting drives Nielsen. And I know a lot of us on this call are measured by Nielsen, but we have to kind of get away from that desperation of contest, contest, contest. Otherwise it comes off like the kid at lunch that just says, here, eat my lunch and be my friend. I just think we're better than that. Absolutely. I think it was a great <laughs> statement uh, for, moving, for moving forward. Um, obviously we all know the problems that are sometimes behind and obviously you seem to have like all the freedom in the world to, to do that at Alpha. And I think that's um, that's a great statement for, for the group in general. So um, just uh, switching gears here a little bit. So obviously your experience in US radio, Phil, is uh, incredible. But uh, what a lot, I don't know if a lot of people know that, but we did some research and uh, obviously uh, you helped us like doing that. So you launched a national CHR station in Jamaica. So that's like uh, really interesting to me. So obviously I worked in different countries. I, I met different people as well as uh, Ken or Mr. Worldwide did. So what was the experience like and what was <laughs> it different 
uh, than than working in American radio. I think that's that's um, that would be my question because I've never been to Jamaica. I can just imagine like um, uh, what it will be being in the Caribbean. So that would be really interesting. I think. Uh, yeah, happy to to, happy to answer that for you. So um, uh, I did launch uh, FIA one hundred and five, which is a Jamaican CHR station. Did it about 10, 12 years ago. Um, and I'll share with you the first part on where the name came from, because I think it's really interesting. So I did not go there actually to create a radio station. Uh, I was hired to go there and be a part of the build out, how the studio should be laid out, how the conference room should lay, be laid out, you know, the rack room, that sort of thing. And I noticed that every time I would turn on a radio station, they would yell out the word FIA. It's Mo Faya, bring back the Faya, Mo Faya, Faya. And that was like the, the buzzy word 10, 12 years ago. And so I happened to ask the people there, I said, so do you guys have like um, a way in which you measure the popularity of radio stations? And they said, yeah, yeah, they, we, we mail out these things to different parishes and then you fill them out and then you mail them back and then you get uh, your audience totals. And I was like, boy, that sounds familiar. <laughs> and so... When they, when they asked me to help them build a brand, they said, what should we call it? And they go, well, here's the thing. Everybody down there is yelling the word FIA. So all they're really doing is reinforcing your name if you decide to call yourself FIA. So it was like the Trojan horse idea that they walked it in. Um, and so that's where the actual name came from was, I'm gonna lean into an opportunity here. Um, so what I learned from it was really interesting. So it was my, it was one of my trips down there and I was flying into Kingston and truly working in Jamaica in the general population, not in the resort space, right? That we all see from around the world. And so I was on a plane with a guy and I, and I believe that like the universe gives you the lessons you need sometimes. And the guy sitting next to me, and this is the craziest thing. You know, when you, when you check your bags, right? Your most valuable things you take as your carry-ons, right? Your other stuff, you just throw in there and hope the airline doesn't lose your luggage. But your valuable <laughs> stuff, you carry with you. Guess what he had in his lap? He had a radio. That's what he wow. chose to be his most valuable thing. And so I sat there with him on this flight and I got to know the guy and I started to ask him questions. And um, it's also interesting because uh, at the time I was living in the Midwest and he said, are you from New York or Miami? <laughs> and, I, and I go, what do you, what? And he goes, well, everybody in the Jamaica, you know, is from New York or Miami. And, and so I got to learn his perceptions of America. Uh, he got to learn my perceptions of Jamaica and, and I began to build this radio station. And what I learned was, one, a radio is super, super valuable to him. It was his carry-on. Two, a lot of the population, and still, this is you know a decade ago, still doesn't have the infrastructure for streaming and Wi-Fi, so they don't have as many you know additional options. Three, they never had until until we put on fire. This is this is crazy. They never had a singular formatted radio station. Everything was open source. Everything was open format. It was like on Saturdays, we do this. On Mondays, we do this. On after three o'clock, we do this. And so we were the first station to come in and do a, do a structured uh, format of one specific type of music, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365. And we're rewarded for it. Um, I also learned that um, sometimes people want a big idea. So when we first put the station on, I got a call from the station owner and he said, uh, Phil, we love what we're doing, but we have one change. I said, okay. And he said, it sounds too Jamaican. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, wait a minute. Aren't we supposed to be local? Aren't we supposed to serve our market? Aren't we supposed to be all these things? And he goes, yeah, but we wanted to work with you because we wanted it to sound global. We wanted it to sound big. We wanted it to sound this way and that way. So, so I guess the lessons were, at the end of the day, the biggest movie in the world is Spider-Man, no matter where you're living. The most watched buzzy show right now is Euphoria, no matter where you're living. And, and even if you're in Jamaica, you're probably listening to Push and P on the hip hop station, 
even though you're in Jamaica. Right. So, so that was the the lesson for me. Yeah, and I think for those of us like Andy and I who've worked in many countries over the years, it's just such a fascinating experience to get outside what you know and, and all the things you learn culturally and regulatory wise and competitive wise in these different markets challenges many of your assumptions uh, that you kind of take with you and they don't all necessarily work or apply and that's fine, but this is how new ideas come about as well. So I'm sure that certainly helps you in your day-to-day -day role at Alpha today. So another question we've got to ask about is, is really the pandemic. I mean, every conversation, every time you pick the phone, people are asking about COVID and Omicron. Uh, so what I want to ask about instead of, you know, how we all dealt with that is what, if anything good, has come out of that for you, Alpha, and your radio stations? Yeah. Oh, I love that. Um, yeah, I think the first thing that, that, that came out of it uh, in, the, in the good is forcing ourselves to live in the solution. See, I, I don't know that all broadcasters would have been willing to try new things, going back to your very first question, if we didn't have a pandemic. I think the pandemic made us say, okay, let's try this because we don't have a choice, right? We, 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 are, we don't have people in an office necessarily in the traditional sense. So I think what's come out of it in the positive is um, instead of just saying, well, the uh, the commute is gone or people are consuming the radio less because of virtual learning or virtual work i think it forced us to live in the solution and find new technologies and find new resources i think that um it also forced us to begin to um create things that took the place of contesting like i mentioned a moment ago when there's when there's no uh, concert tickets to give away. Well, what are you going to do? Right. I think, I think that that really, <laughs> that really helped the, uh, helped us. I also think that, um, when we, when we sat there and we learned about disruption in listening and, and the way that, you know, the in office listening stations and how they were impacted by Nielsen. I think if you take a look over the last 18 months, you'll see some unique music mixes in different markets that are now really focused on just total audience as opposed to we've always done it this way because we want to be the in-office station. Um, and, and for us, we've leaned more into um, the digital space. We created a podcast uh, called The Spout Podcast. And, you know, I think sometimes broadcasters talk about podcasting because, you know, well, it's audio and we're in the audio business and podcast and broadcast rhyme. So I guess we should do something. Um, <laughs> and, and instead of going all the way back to Anytime you create a product, right? What I always look at is I say, well, what, what problem is this product solving? What problem am I solving? And that is kind of the beginning of any time that I create a product. And what I learned uh, uh, looking at all the podcast space is I was like, well, wait a minute. We're not going to be able to out profile Joe Rogan. We're not going to be able to out... Um, uh, out funny Will Ferrell. We're not going to be able to jump in the oversaturated uh, true crime category and beat last podcast on the left or my favorite murder. So what do we have that most podcasters don't? Well, one, we have a pretty good understanding of how to create audio. And two, we have access. And so we created this about podcast and, and used our access to secure a conversation with Adele to secure a conversation with Billie Eilish, to secure a conversation with Ed Sheeran, to secure a conversation with Lil Nas X and Shawn Mendes and Charlie Puth and, and all of these artists that we have the access to. And I don't know that if there was a COVID, we would have thought of that. I think we probably would have just said, can you cut some liners? Or, <laughs> or you know, can, you know can, you, can we do a meet and greet? So I do think that, that COVID, at least for me, made me say, um, what can I do now in a pandemic world that I probably wouldn't have done before? And that's where that came from. Yeah, I think it reset the table for a lot of things and a lot of people changed their life models and thoughts. Um, but uh, not, not less, I mean, this is a great outcome on, on certain, certain ends, but uh, obviously radio is facing ongoing revenue pressure, maybe even 
more through COVID. Mm -hmm. So how do you continue? And this is me as an entrepreneur having obviously the same type of challenges working mostly for radio and audio, audio products. So how do you continue to make engaging, engaging radio with fewer resources? And on the other side, um, how do you prioritize the allocation of these resources? That's something like we, uh, we try to be very, very cautious and we're looking like very specifically, I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on that. Sure, Andy. So I, I think the first, the first thing is COVID created the ability and the moment for us to step back and say, okay, well, let's not do what we always did. You know, and, and you know, you, you always hear as a leader, as a manager, you, you always say, you know, you always hear in every book you ever read, don't do it because you always did it. You know, we've always done it that way. Well, well, now we didn't have a choice. So, so when you have limited resources, one of our market managers said the line to me one day that, that has rung through to me for my career. We were going through her programming budget and she said, well, you realize, Phil, that all budgets are a bunch of boxes. And I go, that's true. <laughs> and she goes, and inside each one of those boxes is a choice. So we get to choose what number goes in what box. At the end of the day, if the budget number is still the operating budget number, does it matter what box it came from? And and that that really you know made me go, oh, you know what, you're right. And so to go, well, let's not sit there and say that you know we only have X amount of dollars for this guy, or we only have X amount of dollars for research, or we only have X amount of dollars for imaging, or we only have X amount of dollars for you know uh, voice tracking or promotions or whatever. Let's go back to the baseline and ask ourselves, what do we want to do? That's the first question. Why do we want to do it? What's the actual strategy or tactic behind it? What do we hope the outcome will be? Who's going to help us and when will it be done by? And so, and so for me, yes, we have smaller resources and yes, we like every other broadcaster have smaller teams and yes, we don't have you know, a, a street team out in every market with, you know, five part timers handing out bumper stickers and, and spinning a prize wheel. But does that work? <laughs> does it work? You know, and or can we take that money or take a percentage of that money and allocate it towards things that might actually be yeah. new and different? I, I think it depends where you are, right? So if you're mm -hmm. basically still doing the thing everybody does, the, the, the question and, and saving and reshifting is maybe a little bit easier and more transparent than for organizations that are already pretty streamlined and, and do things like differently already. So I, I agree 100%. So I think that's a... Uh, that's a great that's a great uh, that's a great answer and also a great food for thought to just think of like prioritize and then allocate the money after prioritization not after like that has been always the way so that could work for a lot of people that work in budgeting in a traditional way to open up their minds and build like a, a scenario that they might be more happy with afterwards so i think it's uh, that's that's great advice thanks yeah thank you for asking so phil there's one question that we hear over and over again with our international clients in our travels, uh, the whole radio industry is asking, and I just thought you might have an opinion on this or some suggestions or ideas on what to do, but how do we keep radio relevant for the young people in the world today? They didn't grow up with it like we did. And it's, yeah. you know, they've got a phone in their hand all the time and social media galore and everything at their fingertips. So fire away. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think the first thing we have to do is we have to stop abusing young people with unit loads. You have to understand that this is a generation that that is is used to five second commercials on YouTube that they can skip past. So so they're not sitting there through a seven minute stop set two or three times an hour. I think we have to start with that. Now, I say things like that, and then people say to me, well, yeah, Phil, but how are we going to hit our revenue numbers if we don't do that? Well, let's sit down and solve that, right? Live in the solution. I keep going back to that because there is an answer in there somewhere. But I think the first thing is they're not going to come to us with abusive unit loads. I think the other thing that, that they're not going to come back to us for in the way that we'd like them to is if we don't be our true authentic self. Ken, how old are your boys? 
20 and 22. 20 and 22. They probably think radio is old school and kind of phony, right? They, they, yeah, among yeah. other things, but among yes. Things. Yeah. And rarely, rarely <laughs> consume it. Right. So, <laughs> so, so it could be, here's why. They've been abused with unit loads. It's not authentic. You know, they're, 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 some, some people are extremely authentic on the radio. And they're magical and they cut through and they're special. But I can pretty much assure you that your name isn't Cactus Jack and your name isn't, you know, DJ everybody. And we've, we, we just need to talk to them, right? We just need to get away from Cactus Jack and the prickly morning morning show, the prickly morning show. Like, <laughs> like let's do something real and authentic. You know, I had somebody ask me, they're like, how many years were you on the air, Phil? I said, 25. They said, what was your name? I said, Phil Becker. They go, what's your real name? I go, Phil Becker. <laughs> Let's talk to them authentically, right? And then when we do yeah. talk to them, stop yelling at them. You know, if, if your boys are Spotify consumers or DSP consumers in whatever capacity, if they were listening to Rap Caviar, right? When they're listening to that playlist, which is curated by a programmer, no different than many of the people on this call, it's not an algorithm. There's a person that makes the playlist for Rap Caviar. Between every song, they don't yell, you're listening to Rap Caviar. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, man, does radio do it. So yeah, stop yelling true. at them. Stop abusing them with unit loads. Be your true authentic self. And also understand that sometimes... A product focused on Nielsen and a product focused on young people are different products. And find a way to build your cluster, build your operation, build your company so that you can say, hey, I don't need this station to produce a 0.5 rating, 25 to 54. I just need this to bring young people back to terrestrial radio. Because if we're not careful, and I'm so glad you asked the question, and we don't bring young people in by being authentic, changing our unit loads, changing our approach, focusing on the fan as opposed to the meter. Every terrestrial radio station will be 50 plus. Yeah. So yeah, we're so getting we're, there. I can yeah, tell you yeah. we're getting there. My kids are even younger. And I mean, obviously my wife listens to radio, but like for my kids, it's besides being in the car with no ear pods in is it's not even a thing because like you said, like the attention span is like so short. It's, their consumption behavior is so different because it's learned and triggered in so many different ways. And uh, yeah, absolutely, I, I totally agree. It's, it's a big danger um, that we fall into that trap. You know, I, I, I think that the cool thing is that you guys are doing conversations like this. I think it's, it's a wonderful thing to see 500 people today getting together to talk about how we make ourselves better. Um, and I don't think that we are in a place where... Um, where we're in trouble, but the doctor is going to walk in and tell us, you know, you could lose a few pounds and uh, your oxygen levels are a little low. Right. So Phil, I want to add one more question before we turn it over to the audience. So if you're watching today, I have a question for Phil, just type it in the chat box. We'll get to them in just one moment. But Phil, it's really come to me uh, clearly. I think sets apart why you're different and why you're successful is you you challenge the establishment and you think differently than most other people in radio today so i applaud you for that uh and, and i think a, 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 an example of this is something that for 40 years prior to covid uh you created an invite only radio conference held in portland and unlike most radio companies that put together a conference where they fly their own people in you actually invited people from other radio groups. Mm -hmm. um, so why do you do that? Yeah, well, the first thing is to the credit of the of the gentleman with business cards bigger than me, that they were willing and open to allowing me to do that. You know, and, and I'm sure there are other people that want to do that. I'm just fortunate and blessed that that at Alpha they they trust the vision of this and they're like, yeah, invite others. Um, so why did I do it? You know, it's it's a lot like why you hold these webinars. I think that you do them because you want the industry to thrive. You want the industry to be the best that it can be. And you understand like Pfizer, Moderna and Johnson and Johnson, we're not going to get to the answers by ourselves, right? We have to lean on each other to get to the answer. There would be no 
uh, vaccine as rapid as there was if we all were on our island doing our own thing. So I think it's, you know, to the credit of, of, of Alpha, they understand that what we're going to talk about is to better us collectively. That's the first reason we invited others. Uh, the second reason that we invited others is what really are we going to talk about that's some sort of secret with the internet, <laughs> with media monitoring systems, with, with, yeah, with exactly. you know, like, like yeah. what, what, you know, do, do you think you're going to figure out that, that uh, my Omnia processor is on this or that? Like, it, you know, <laughs> that's not going to change your yeah. win or loss ratio. And so, I, I got to give a lot of credit to to the executives at Alpha that allowed other people to join us. Um, and the other reason that we did it was because it's a hell of a recruitment tool, man. You were you were there, Ken, right? And yeah, and it's it, amazing. And, it, yeah. And it, and if you if you're working for another company, and I call and invite you to uh, to join us, and you say to me, Phil, I work for so and so. I can't come to that. Are you crazy? I can't come to your corporate office and come to to your event. I say, Oh, it's okay. Does does your company invite you to their events? Oh well, listen. Next time, <laughs> next time, next time you're looking for something, you know, we'd love to have you join us. So it's really helped us grow our portfolio for recruitment, focused on the greater good of uh, improving radio as a whole. And, and realizing that we need to get out of fear-based decisions and just make Absolutely. decisions for everyone's growth. Yeah, yeah I think it's yeah. such a great tool, obviously. it's I think the recruitment aspect and like getting to know new people, new ideas, like it's key. And I think uh, we've done this for years with uh, Iron Imager, for example, mm -hmm. that imaging contest that we hold that no one out of Benstown's team ever participates. And like, obviously people win that from other companies or like uh, maybe stations we don't work with, but that's fine because it's it's all about, like you said, the greater good and educating people and and then creating a bond with, with people that are in the same boat. I think that's super smart. And if you do it next time, I'd love to join and see it myself. I think You're coming. Like, but Ken told me it's fantastic. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's it's an amazing event. I, I look forward to the pandemic being behind us so you can do it again. And if I were one of the people on this webinar today, I'd be trying to get to know you and, and be begging for an invitation because oh, it's uh, a great event. <laughs> thank so, you so much. Your email box is going to be filled by the time we finish. The call <laughs> I want to come uh, to the event. I want to come. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the name of today's group was Stop Using Best Practices and Try Something New. Uh, had some great advice from Phil earlier. And now we're going to take your questions for Phil. Again, if you have something, just type it in the chat box. Um, one, I'll make a statement that somebody typed in here from Paige Neonaber. And if you know me, he's a brilliant promotion and marketing consultant. He says, if it ain't broke, break it. And, and then I think uh, really the question is from uh, somebody named Darren. Um, when we talk about these stations, he wants to know what stations are doing rock. How many logs that you're recommending? Yeah, ha happy to answer that. And hi, hi Paige, and, and thank you for asking, Darren. I appreciate it. Um, I, I'll give a lot of credit to, I'll pick a few. Um, I think what Kink is doing in Portland is really special, Ken. Um, what Gene Sandbloom and Lisa Decker and their team are doing is is really unique because it's, it's leaning into curation as opposed to duplication. Um, Gene has said to me on multiple occasions, uh, Kink is a AAA station in Portland, Oregon, for those of you that, that aren't aware. He said to me, Phil, if I was playing the records that the AAA format was playing, we'd be in another format. Um, and, you know, he's really created a meaningful and special playlist that he believes serves his core audience. Um, and, and to the credit of Gene and to Lisa and to our CEO, Bob Profit, they gave it time to develop. They didn't sit there and go, well, it's Wednesday at noon. Let's pull up the weeklies and see what happens. They spent the last few years letting it percolate. And, and, and typically, Kink in Portland, KNK, is the highest rated AAA station in America. Uh, it's Kink and, and Austin, usually neck and neck, month after month. So I think they do a really good job. Um, I, I was just so happy to see... I'll give you a great example. They're a AAA station playing gasoline from the weekend, right? And and wow. to the and to the credit of a lot of people on this call, in in other countries they don't put things in boxes like we do in the states. 
We love boxes in the States. That's our favorite thing. This is a fast food restaurant. This is a sit down restaurant. This is the weather channel. This is the sports channel. This is the top 40 format. Um, <laughs> and, and he didn't do that. So I think they're doing it right. Um, I think that uh, KBFF in Portland, uh, that's the top 40 station that we have, is, is trying things, taking chances, breaking stuff. I love Paige's line break stuff. If, if you ever come to my office, you'll see uh, a pillow and the, one of the pillows says there were rules. And, and if you ask yourself, if there weren't these supposed self-induced, by the way, rules, what would you do that's special? You know, and I think that those guys do a great job uh, on, on KBFF. You know, they, they were, they're fighting against iHeart. They're beating a month after month. I think what Kink is doing is really special. It's curating. I think that um, what Jack in San Antonio does that's really special is they use the Jack network, but they also make it so San Antonio that it thrives. Um, you know, if someone asked me the other day, what's the secret sauce? If the Jack station is here from, from Gary Wall's network and the Jack station's here, and so the secret sauce is everything else, right? My favorite sweepers and promos are the ones that if I don't live there, I wouldn't understand it. That's when I know something's good. If I turn on a station and they, they mention something and I'm like, what does that even mean? It probably means it's super local. Uh, so I think that they're doing a, a really good job. Um, so there's a top 40 a classic hits and a AAA example. Great. So there is a question uh, from Darren. No, that, that's the, from, from Big Red. What excites you the most about the future of radio? I mean, a very broad question. Obviously, we discussed the break, the break it, uh, the break it part, and obviously, I, I assume that's like exciting. But what else in terms of like technologies, possibilities, delivering, like what is what is most exciting to you? Yeah, um, I think that one of the things that's going to become um, a priority for a lot of broadcasters is going to be on-demand products that aren't over the terrestrial stream. You know, it used to be people would say, well, we're not going to do those because of the licensing fees or the pure plays and what it's going to cost. And now that most broadcasters have figured out real meaningful programmatic revenue that can be done in off air streams and, and, and most big broadcasters, at least in the States, don't total line report now. So that's kind of changing the way in which, you know, I think on demand stuff will come. So on demand is actually what excites me because I think that that freedom is going to be where a lot of the magic lives. I think that freedom to say, hey, this isn't governed by the FCC or this isn't designed to, yeah. to target you know, this audience or that. And I'm just going to make art. I, I think that that is going to be a really special thing. And I think now that people have figured out a way to monetize it, it can, it can be justified. So that's my prediction for what's coming next and, and what excites me. Great. Uh, another question comes from Scott in Dublin. Any thoughts on talk programming for younger audiences, considering the appeal of podcasts? And mm. what should we talk about? Yeah, that's an awesome question, Scott. Um, I, I do believe that um, talk products for younger people um, are in demand. Uh, they have been. In fact, because we ignored them, they said, ah, I'll go listen to a podcast. We actually created the um, the hyper microwave popularity of certain podcasts because to Scott's point, a very, very valid one, young people really weren't getting served that. Um, so I do believe that there's a there's a play there. I believe that the next big talk personality is not on the radio. They're they're in a podcast space. And I think that you could have entire radio stations that are nothing but podcasts targeting a certain audience. Um, you know, it's just, it's, 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 uh, you know, it's scalable. The technology can deliver it very, very easily. It can be close to automated. It's cost effective as you don't have a lot of music licensing fees. Um, and you know, the biggest thing in life and in radio and in a restaurant and in something you post on your social accounts is you're rewarded for your differences, not your similarities. Yeah. And, and I think there is countries still where like talk radio for young people actually works pretty well, like Italy. You'll see like a lot of CHR stations with massive like talk breaks, for example, um, in Italy, like Kiss Kiss or there's certain formats there definitely have like far more talk 
than like the traditional like play the next hit type of stations. Mm -hmm. So Rico so, so, Garcia, yeah. Ken? I was going to just add something on to this conversation because I think it's an interesting point. I'd love Phil's opinion on this. Um, I think it was in December, I was speaking with Roy Laughlin, who for many years was the general manager of, of KISS in Los Angeles. And we chatted a lot about CHR, which is dear to both of our hearts. And, and he thought, or, you know, maybe his suggestion was, or at least had, had a gut instinct that this might be a successful show on a CHR today. I mean, being much more than just the jukebox contest machine that many top 40s have been historically. He's like, look, this pandemic has created mass depression and anxiety amongst young people. Suicide rates with young people are skyrocketing. Um, why doesn't a CHR station have a program with a psychologist on where they take calls and actually address these real things with listeners? And um, you know, I think it's a great idea. And it even made me think back to when I was a, a teenager in New York listening to a show by Dr. Ruth Westheimer on Sunday nights, which was a sex talk show. And every kid in school would listen to it and talk about it the next day. But it was a place that, you know, you could go and actually call and ask a question and get a real answer uh, in, in a safe space. And um, I is mean, that can the podcast field is wide open. Can the podcast field for your sex talk show is wide open? Like, I'll be the first caller. Like, I call and ask <laughs> Ken some questions. So, yeah, I mean, I think my only one, right? <laughs> I have a feeling that Ken would immediately recognize your voice, Andy, when you call. But yeah. um, like, hello, Ken. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I think I, I do think it's super viable. I think right now you could start a um, a psychology or sex or life advice motivational show called "Asking for a Friend." There it is. That's the name right there. It's "Asking for a Friend." And and now yeah, just trademark that. <laughs> and 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 you walk them through. You know, it's it's funny you bring that up. I I grew up listening to B ninety six out of Chicago. That was the station that really formed, you know, my my radio mind. And there was a show on on Sunday nights, same sort of thing, where they would talk about, hey, I have a question about drinking, or I have a question about sex, or I have a question about my boyfriend or my girlfriend or my mom or my dad or my brother. And, and I just, I couldn't turn it off, you know, and I was, you know, probably listening to that from the age of 13 to 17. And it, and it actually really helped me. Um, I do think that it, that it would play. I do think that people it's, it, it's okay now to talk about your feelings more than it, maybe it was back when we had to say the number one hit music station, 17 times an hour. You know, I think now you can just share and, and, and talk. So I would love to see someone do it. If there's someone on the on the call that would like to develop it, I'd, I'd love to weigh in and, and try to offer some advice. I think it's important and I think it's needed. And I think that if you go all the way back to, at least in the States, where you're licensed to serve a community, here's a show that would serve the community. I agree. I think that's a nice, I mean, there's so many other questions and I will think we can, uh, we can maybe like comp that as emails and, and maybe have it to fill or somehow. But um, I think that was a wonderful end. So I think like delivering a purpose is something that radio has forgotten, in my opinion, Phil, big time over the course of the last years because of whatever, like not breaking, not breaking it or, or creating best practices. So. Well, Phil Becker, thank you so much for being on the webinar today. Um, some extraordinary thoughts, tips, and advice, and, and we do appreciate it. Um, also, before we go, I want to say congratulations to our producer, Suzanne, who uh, helps us get this together each time. She got married over the Christmas holiday, so we want to say congratulations. Uh, and if you'd like to share this video or watch it again, it'll be posted tomorrow on the P1 Media Group site and Benstown and also on all our social channels. So again, feel free to watch it and share it. You can also contact Phil Becker, our guest, Phil at alphamediausa.com. And we're gonna be back now in three weeks, the 17th of February, same time at uh, 1 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. CET. And the name of that webinar is What We Can Learn from America's Most Popular Music Format. Join us as we chat with uh, RJ Curtis only days before the country radio seminar begins in Nashville. So on behalf of Phil, 
P1 Media Group in Benstown. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you on the 17th of February. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Phil. Thanks so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure.